Hi, I'm Dr. Kyle Montgomery, and in this video we'll be going through a circuit that involves a series RLC configuration, um, specifically looking at a, the natural response case. So what you see here in the circuit diagram, which I encourage you to maybe pause the video and uh, go ahead and copy this down in your notes, but uh, what we have is initially we have a switch here that's initially closed, right? So this 9 volt uh, voltage source is going to be supplying some voltage and current to the resistors, inductor, and capacitor that are over on the other side. And then at time t equals zero, we're going to open up this switch, thereby basically disconnecting this voltage source. And so we see we'll have the natural response uh, given by what the current in the inductor and the voltage across the capacitor are going to be doing as a function of um, time there. Uh, as it goes out to t equals infinity, of course, then we would uh, everything would just relax back down to uh, zero because it would be the full natural response that we'd have. So in order to evaluate, uh, in this case, let's say we're going to evaluate what the voltage across that capacitor is as a function of time. Uh, as we've talked about before, we know that in order to do that, we need to kind of go through a, a series of steps before we can just jump right into that final solution that we have. So here we're going to start off with these terms here, looking at the initial voltage condition, the initial derivative of the voltage, the final voltage, which I already kind of mentioned, and then the NEPR frequency alpha and this resonant radiant frequency omega naught. And of course, evaluating these two terms down here, that'll tell us the type of damping response, and then we can work forward to evaluating those uh, coefficients that we'll need for the, that uh, specific equa equation. So first of all, let's start off here with evaluating this initial voltage on my capacitor here. Okay, so uh, we know, again, that in a capacitor, if we can determine what the voltage is before the event, we know that that has to be the same as the voltage after the event, okay, because we know that the voltage in the capacitor cannot change instantaneously. So if we're at steady state and the, the switch is still in the closed position, well, we know that in, at steady state condition, the inductor is more or less acting as a short circuit, right? And the capacitor here is acting as an open circuit. So maybe if I kind of just redraw this in that configuration as to kind of what we would have with the resistors here still uh, playing point there. And so we got plus minus VC as indicated here. Okay, so this is my 40 ohm resistor, this is my 20 ohm, and this is my 80 ohm. Okay, so if we want to know this voltage here, well, if you think about evaluating a KVL type of loop around this loop right here, this would tell us that the voltage of VC would have to be equal to this voltage across the 40 ohm resistor because of the fact that because I have the break in this branch, again, the capacitor is acting as an open circuit where it's steady state, uh, therefore, we can have no current flow through this 20 ohm resistor, so therefore no voltage drop here. So therefore, this voltage has to be the same as this voltage plus to minus across my 40 ohm resistor here, VC. It's going to be the equivalent uh, quantities there. So we see that in this case, I could apply a simple voltage divider type of expression to evaluate what this would be here. So I would have uh, VC is going to be equal to the ratio of the 40 ohm resistor here over the combination of these two, which would be 120 times the total voltage, 9 volts here. Okay. Now with one, with one just minor difference here in the fact that I, I need to indicate a negative here. And why is that? Well, again, I pay attention to the polarity of this voltage source that we have, which is plus to minus, and that you see is in reverse uh, with respect to the voltage of the capacitor which again, I'm just kind of evaluating that in the same respect as the voltage across this resistor here. So this is why I need a negative sign here. If, if you want to kind of prove that to yourself further, just again, maybe write yourself a KVL equation around this loop here, and you'd see that this should equal out to be a negative quantity. Okay, so evaluating uh, this expression here then would give me a quantity of negative three volts for my initial voltage here. All right. So now looking at the second uh, sort of part stage of the problem is evaluating the derivative of the voltage, okay? So remember we talked about we would use the expression uh, that tells us that the, the current through the capacitor at time zero plus is equal to C dV dt. And again, this is dVc at time zero plus, okay? So again, this is just the general relationship for any capacitor relating the current to the derivative of the voltage. 
uh, which we've uh, covered pre uh, in previous lectures. Um, now again, we're looking for this term here. So what we need to, of course, we know what capacitance is uh, C given in the problem. So we need to be able to understand what is the current here, IC, at time zero plus. Well, just by thinking of what's going on in the capacitor, I can't say anything directly, but I see that this capacitor is in series with the inductor here, correct? And so we know that the current through the inductor cannot change instantaneously. So if I indicate this, um, current, let's say going down this direction as I sub L. All right, so we know that I sub L at time zero minus would have to be equivalent to the current at time zero plus. And we know that this inductor current has to be the same as this capacitor current because these two elements are in series. So then the question is, well, what is the inductor current at time uh, zero minus? And uh, for that, we would look again to what the circuit look like, looks like at steady state, which is to say that it says at steady state, the voltage on the, I'm sorry, the capacitor itself is acting as an open circuit. And so because this is acting as an open circuit, the current through this branch is basically shut off. There's no path, pathway for the current to flow. Um, so if there was some initial energy stored in that inductor, it would eventually all dissipate uh, more or less um, applying to the charge that's building up on the capacitor. And then once it reached steady state, there would be no energy stored in my uh, inductor there specifically. So I could have no current flow through this branch. Um, okay, And so that again is telling me what my inductor current is, thereby telling me that my capacitor current is the same, zero amps. Okay, C D V T D T. Of course, capacitance is just a constant. So this tells me that this derivative term has to be equal to zero as well. This would be zero and this would be units of volts per second, okay? Um, okay, so now thinking about how we'd evaluate the final voltage, Vc, as time goes to infinity. Um, for that, again, would be more or less straightforward. If we just imagine uh, we have, again, this circuit here after the switch has been opened, so the nine volt source and the 80 ohm resistor are more or less disconnected here. Um, therefore, I can see that I have no other sources of voltage or current in the remaining part of the circuit, and therefore that would indicate that as time goes to infinity, uh, all the voltages and currents are just going to go to zero. Okay, so nothing to really evaluate there specifically. Um, that's just paying attention to the fact that I only have passive elements remaining uh, in this part of the circuit, so therefore everything just has to go back to zero, okay? Um, all right, so now for the two frequencies that we need to define down here, let me take a quick minute to erase the board and then we'll go into the, those steps. Okay, so now having cleared that out, again, we're now evaluating the two frequencies that we need, the uh, NEPR frequency and the resonant radiant frequency. So we need to apply the expressions that we know for the NEPR frequency in the series configuration because again, after I've opened this switch, we see that these elements, the resistor, capacitor, I'm sorry, the resistors here, the inductor and the capacitor are all in series. So the frequency when we have the series configuration, recall, was R over um, 2L. Okay, so here R, the resistance, would be the combined, the combined resistance of the 40 and the 20 ohm resistor. Okay, so that'll be 60 ohms um, over 2 times the inductance, which is 3 here. So it'll just be 60, give me a quantity of 10. Again, remember this is in radians per second for any angular frequency that we have, okay? So this is 10 radians per second here. Okay, omega naught, the resonant radiant frequency. Again, the expression that we use to evaluate the resonant ra radiant frequency is the same in both the parallel and the series configuration, which is one over the root of LC. So here we have one over the root of the inductance times the capacitance, which, which is nine, so that evaluates out to one-third radians per second. Okay. Okay. So then, once we know those two frequencies, that allows us to evaluate the type of damping response that we have here. So clearly, in this case, our NEPR frequency is greater than the resonant radiant frequency, which is telling us that we have the overdamped uh, response. Okay. And so then applying the general form of the solution 
to any RL, the RLC circuit in the overdamped case would tell us that this voltage VC as a function of time is going to be equal to a constant A1 exponential S1 times time T plus A2 exponential of S2T. Again, we're here S1 is going to be equal to negative alpha plus the root of alpha squared minus omega naught squared. These are just the, uh, again, the roots. S1 and S2 are the roots of the characteristic equation, uh, whereas S2 is minus al uh, negative alpha minus the root of alpha squared minus omega naught squared. Okay, so th these two uh, quantities here are pretty easy to evaluate. Um, but then for finding these constants, A1 and A2, well, again, this is where we need to use what we found initially, the, these initial conditions of the voltage at time zero plus and the derivative of the voltage at time zero plus. That will allow us to evaluate the constants A1 and A2. Uh, we'll go through that process here, but um, just in, in terms of clarifying for S1 and S2, I'll write, um, if we plug these in, uh, we should evaluate these two quantities of S1 equal to, let's see, negative... 0 0.006 and S2 be equal to negative 19.99. Again, I'm just, for these quantities here, just plugging in the terms that we already found up here, written down there as well, uh, would evaluate uh, to those expressions there. So we, we will use these certainly in the final solution, but let's, uh, let me again take a quick minute to erase what I have here and go through the process for figuring out these two constants, A1 and A2. Okay, so now we're working on trying to figure out the uh, constant coefficients here, A1 and A2, in the general form of our solution. Again, this uh, form of the solution is specific to the overdamped response, which again, we uh, determine that by evaluating the comparison of uh, alpha to omega naught. Um, also note that this expression here is, sp is specific for the natural response case, which is what we have here. Now, if we were working with a problem that was actually evaluating a step response, generally meaning some increase uh, in the voltage, let's say in this case, um, that the only difference there is that we would have an additional term uh, before this, or maybe I'll just indicate I would have some initial or last term here, which would be VF, let's say the final voltage. That, that's the only change I would have if we were looking at step response compared to what we have here, which is natural response, okay? But again, because we have natural response, we can kind of <coughs> um, ignore uh, this component here, since that would just be zero, of course, as we've evaluated the final voltage would be equal to zero volts, okay? So now the process, again, for finding A1 and A2 are that I'm looking at the voltage VC as, uh, at time zero plus, and basically then plugging in zero to this equation here that uh, the, takes the exponentials equal to one. So here I just have uh, A1 plus A2. This is e gonna be equal then to minus three volts. Okay, so this is one equation, but again, still two unknown, so I can't do anything by, with this by itself. But then that's why we ha found the derivative of the voltage uh, dV at zero plus dt. And so what I'm doing here then is taking, if I were to take the derivative of this e equation and then again plug in uh, t equals zero to what I'm left with, what I'd have is a1 times s1 plus a2 times s2. And this, in this case, equal zero as we found before. All right, so we, again, we already found S1 and S2, the roots of the characteristic e equation. We found that previously, so we could plug those in here, and I have my two equations with two unknowns. Just evaluate these in whatever method you'd like, substitution and whatnot, to evaluate then what A1 and A2 are. Um, if you go through that process, <coughs> it should come up with value, values of, excuse me, A1 and A2 equal to, let's see, A1 equal to negative 3.0008, and I have for A2 equal to 0 0.0008. <coughs> and these, in this case, are both gonna be voltages V because of the fact that we're evaluating for the voltage across the capacitor V, C of T, okay? So now, having found these constant coefficients for our uh, solution, general form of the solution, we, can, we now have all the information that we need to write the expression for what V, C of T is. 
So basically just plugging in what we have here, I can plug it in back into the final expression to get what we have right here, exponential minus 0.006t, that's S1. And then added to this is A2 times exponential um, with S2 here, negative 19.99t, okay? So this is then our final evaluation for the voltage on that capacitor as a function of time, specifically evaluated for t greater than or equal to zero seconds. Okay, again, indicating after I've opened that switch here, and this is what we would have as a result. Okay, so now again, just a quick recap. Basically what we're doing in any of these types of RLC problems is just working through the process. Again, evaluate your initial conditions, evaluate um, your final condition is always a good uh, practice to do that, even if you immediately know you have natural response. Just go ahead and ask yourself that question, what, what should be the final voltage? Or we, we could be doing a problem evaluating the current through the inductor. And again, we would still follow the same process. Uh, then we want to evaluate our frequencies, uh, the NEPR frequency and um, resonant radiant frequency. Compare those two, that'll tell us the type of damping response. Uh, based on that information, we know what the form of the solution needs to be and use that um, with the initial conditions that we had to evaluate, find out these constant coefficients that, coefficients that we need in that equation. Um, we found S1 and S2, those were the roots of the characteristic equation, and then plug all those back into the general form to come up with our final solution. Okay, that's all for this video. Hope to see you on the next one.